Okay. Yep, we are live. Wait, hold on. Oh. Why? Oh, there it goes. Oh, that's weird. It defaulted to something else for the title. Hmm. I don't know. Oh, hold on. Let me see if I can change this. We might need to do it over again. Do you see that on your end? I see 9418 live stream with Angie Atkinson. Really? Mm -hmm. Let me try refreshing. Nope. Okay, now I see it. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the live stream for September 4th, 2018. This week, I am your host, Dana Morningstar, and with me is Angie Atkinson. Hello. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> So chaos early on in the live stream, but uh, it's live. What are you going to do? Is, uh, yeah, it is. So we are here. We've got lots of people hopping on. Uh, Sam, Sharia, Teresa, C. Rob, Elizabeth, Julia, Melody. Welcome. Welcome. And so uh, two quick things. So we're going to open the live stream this week. We're going to talk a little bit about vision boards this is a project Angie and I are working on. We're going to keep building on it every week, every Tuesday. We're going to be adding stuff to it, and I'll be discussing it on my channel on Wednesdays as well. So if you guys want to think about building your own vision board and kind of what's next in this chapter in your life, this would be a good time to do it. So this week, well, actually, Angie, do you want to talk a little bit about what you have? Sure. Okay. So, Okay. Last week, we got some things together, and I failed to get any together for this week. So I'm going to show you guys the ones from last week because some of you weren't there. So one of the ones I have is an excellent source of can-do because I need to have that as well as, you know, I'm trying to attract, attract more of that into my life. And then strong because for obvious reasons. Also, I had a couple of individual words like um, passions and focus, and then a couple of bigger ones. Um, <laughs> shape because I need to get in better shape. I'm working on that. And also just, just being healthier in general. So that's what I've got today. How about you, Dana? I love it. Okay. So you inspired me last week oh. and as you normally do. And, um, when you were talking about like, you're wanting to get into shape and the whole weight loss thing. And I'm like, you know, yeah, like I've been talking about this for way too long now. And, I did a lot of like journaling about it and thinking about it. And so I am going to go with you on your journey on. and That's we'll do, good. yeah, we'll be like, you can be like co-pilots. Love it. Yeah. Love it. So anyways, I found this guy, he's my new favorite um, YouTuber. I'm vegetarian, but I eat primarily vegan. Um, anyway, he's a vegan YouTuber. His name is Avant Garde Vegan mm. and He's gorgeous. I'm old enough to be his mother, I'm sure, but he's darling. That's and, awesome. <laughs> uh, he makes the best recipes. Oh my gosh, he's a vegan chef. And so I am just like in love with the food that he makes. And so I picked this picture because I really like his recipes and I want to get involved in making his recipes. And I like the look on his face. Like he's just really having a good time. He's in the moment. He's just enjoying cooking. And that's something that I kind of struggle with. And I want to have more of that. So then I have a picture here of vegan sushi, which is um, something I would like to make. I know it's pretty easy. Um, just something. And then I have two more pictures here of aerial yoga. I used to be super into aerial yoga. Oh, wow. And I love it. It feels amazing for my back. And just to be kind of... Um, like in the swing, mm -hmm. the aerial swing is just a really comforting feeling. And so this is actually my favorite aerial yoga pose. Oh, nice. And it feels so amazing. And it's so fun to just balance on a swing and to be fully present in your body. It's just such a cool thing. So I signed up for an aerial yoga class again this coming Sunday. So That's I'm excited. Awesome. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Very cool. Love it. So that's, so, so are we, I guess we're going to each bring something to each of these live streams. And then you said you're going to talk about it again on Wednesdays on your channel. Is that right? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So yeah. And I, I would encourage you guys in the chat, if you're interested in doing a vision board to think about, you can follow along with us, brings 
it, it really does help to, I think, chunk it down into finding like one or two pictures a week. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't even have to be like to this. You don't even have to find pictures like this. Like you can find words, you can find colors, Like there's no wrong way to do this. And so you can just slowly kind of build up your, yes. your vision board. Absolutely. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. So let's see here. Oh, and there was a question you said one of your viewers had asked that we were going to talk about. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to leave her name anonymous. Okay. Um, but she had asked basically, what is the difference between us feeling love addicted to a narcissist and them playing mind games with us and kind of creating that intermittent reinforcement and creating that addictive feeling within us. So basically, is it us or is it them? Well, I'll start us off if that's okay. Go for it. I think it's both. Um, we are definitely addicted to them. And we've talked before, I'm sure we've talked about it here. We've talked about it on my channel before about how the same part of the brain is affected by a toxic love addiction as, or a toxic love, love roommate, narcissistic abuse as a drug. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Love in general though, not just toxic love, but in the case of narcissistic abuse, we develop like a Stockholm syndrome, trauma bonding, that kind of stuff. And so certainly we are still, we miss them. We only think about the good things we tolerate, you know, in the most extreme cases, we even almost enable our own abuse by, tolerating it and and lending ourselves to it i'll leave it at that but with that being said on their side of it you know they're always after supply they're always looking for supply and so if for some reason let's like, say they discard you they go with someone else that person doesn't have time to pay attention to them that day or they're in an argument or they just need a little extra attention and you're really good at giving it to them you know they're going to come to you and they're going to they're going to miss you. They're going to love you. They're going to be like all the things, or they're going to start drama with you. Either way, it's about supply. So I think it's a, a two-sided coin. Unfortunately, it's a very toxic mutual thing. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess maybe another way to look at it too, is to figure out, is this an event or a pattern? Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's easy to get caught up in that intermittent reinforcement and the trauma bonds and Stockholm syndrome, everything that Angie's talking about. If you don't, if you're not aware of it, like most people have no idea, like this, this push, pull, the on, off, the highs, the lows, these intense bonds that they can form with another person. But if you know about that and you're still finding yourself getting into relationships with people like this and you're feeling or you've noticed in the past that you're feeling like addicted to other people, this is a really big sign that we're basically looking towards others to kind of fill this emotional void within us mm -hmm. because narcissists, that up, down, push, pull, hot, cold kind of behavior only works once you're not aware of it. And once you're aware of it um, and you can see it for what it is, you don't, it's a lot easier to not get caught up in it. I mean, most people, I think you've probably seen this too, Angie, like in support groups and such, you know, after they break up with this, this one person that maybe caused them to find our channels, they, um, they start dating and then they crash into somebody else. But then this time around, they see all the games for what they are and they're out within like a matter of weeks, days, or even hours. And I think that's true. Unless they start dating before they heal. Then yes. They yeah. I agree. Unless they start dating before they understand what's going on. Yeah. But like if they, and before they heal, but if you understand, like if you know what love addiction is and you're, and you understand the bonds that these people, this kind of behavior can create and you're still falling into it, there's still, there's still unaddressed stuff there. Yes. So, I mean, a narcissist can play, I mean, I've had a handful since my last narcissistic relationship, um, have played these kinds of games, but I've walked away. Yeah. So they can only make you feel their behavior can only feel, create that addictive feeling. If you're, if you fall into it, if you don't, you're like Psh, done. <laughs> like I don't have time for games. Goodbye. Yeah. Yep. Totally yeah. agree. Yep. Oh boy. Here's a question for you. What you got? Um, this is from Denise who says, I just found out this weekend, my husband has been going to a nude camp. 
or naturalistic camp? Is this something a narcissist does? I live in a small town. I didn't even know we had them. Hmm. I haven't confronted him yet. Please advise. Okay. Um, I don't think it's just a narcissistic thing, um, but I do think that hiding it might be <laughs> um, yeah. disordered. Um, and so I think, I don't know your personal narcissist, but I think that going to one of these camps could possibly be a form of supply if they're especially proud of their body. Um, it could also be a voyeur thing where they're going just to look at all the other people. And it could also be a sex thing, unfortunately. I don't think that most of those camps are like that, but I don't really know because I don't go to those camps, so I can't totally speak. But from what I understand, some of them are, you know, respectful in that respect. You know, they, they, they aren't promoting anything like that. So I think it just depends. Um, should you confront him? I would only confront him with it now if you have a reason to. Um, if you're in the process of trying to leave or go no contact or whatever, then I would not confront him. I would put it in your back pocket in case you need it. <laughs> I would do some research on the camp just because I'm like that. I would try to find out what it's about. And um, I would have all my ducks in a row before, it, before I do any confrontation. Um, the fact that he's hiding it from you is very suspicious. I would like to know, to know how you found out and what, what you hope to accomplish by confronting him. Because as we all know, when we confront a narcissist the wrong way, well, any way really, that doesn't sound like, oh my God, you're so amazing. Then we end up regretting it, even if we're, even when we're right, which is nearly, is often, <laughs> at least. What do you think, Dana? Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Like there's, you know, for me, that would be deal breaker behavior. That's a pretty big yeah. thing to hide from another spouse and he obviously knows it's a big deal or he wouldn't have hidden it. Exactly. And you know, that's, this kind of goes back to trying to teach adult behavior to other adults. Like I don't even play that game. Right. So if you were to confront him and he plays stupid, like, well, I didn't know this was a big deal or there wasn't sex involved or like, you shouldn't have to spell out, you know, that this is not okay. We need to talk about things. If other people are going to be seeing you naked, and if you're seeing other people naked, even if it's not a sex thing, this is something that we as a couple need to agree on. I agree. And I think any person with any reasonable amount of common sense could see it that way. So the well, fact I, I that you're just they, frank, yeah, go ahead. No, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I think that's exactly... I'm with you 100%. The only reason I said don't confront him about it now is because I would get my information first. I would know what I'm talking about before I do it. And I would be prepared because for me, it's also a deal breaker. I would be prepared to go. Like, and have yeah. Him. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go. And, and, and I would totally like Angie saying, you know, if you're going to confront him about stuff, have a plan in place because what he's going to do is he's going to make it seem like you're a prude and that this is no big deal and that he didn't tell you because he didn't want to upset you. And he's going to have, he's going to shift the blame. Yep. And there's not going to be any resolution to this. He's obviously been hiding this for a while. And if he's hiding this, then it kind of begs the question of, well, then what else is he hiding? So, oh. you know, yeah. like, I <laughs> just... I don't know. I, I like Angie's point of um, kind of putting this in your back pocket. I would just start documenting stuff. And if you're thinking about leaving, I would start documenting stuff and just start digging. And for the record, if I were you, I would be thinking about leaving. Yeah, I would do. Yeah, that's what's outrageous behavior. I mean, come on. That's yeah. It's and, and again, it would be different if it was a couple thing that you were both doing together, or at least that he would speak to you about it first. But Dana's right being naked in front of other adults or anyone besides your spouse is really something that you both have to agree on ahead of time, I think. Yeah. And I should just clarify it. Like I would totally go to a nudist camp just to see what it's about, but I would never go without telling Travis or without being okay that he's okay with that. And, and you're probably inviting him along. Right. You know, right. like, so it's not, it's not the guy of a, you know, and even if I did have hangups about nudity, like it, it doesn't even matter. Like, it's just, that's something that couples need to agree on with that kind of thing. So yeah. For spending an entire weekend somewhere with naked people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. That's a problem. Uh, that's yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Here's, here's one. This is 
This is tough um, from Deborah, who says, now that I've signed my divorce papers, how do I explain to my children ages ranging from 26 to 16 what I have gone through? Hmm. Okay. If your children were, go, you know, grew up in the house with you and the narcissist, then they already have an idea, whether you know it or not. They are aware. Now, they might, there are some cases where they hide it, so, moms and dads hide it so well that the kids really don't know, but there's, those are very rare cases. And unless your children are not at all empathetic, you know, m my kids know if my stomach hurts just by the way my eyes look, you know what I'm saying? Even if I'm trying to be tough, I mean, I, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but your kids know, they know more than you think they know. With that being said, if they don't know and they truly, you know, then maybe sit down and explain to them, but understand that I guess my thing would be, figure out what the value is in them knowing if it's a matter of them understanding you so they can stay in your life. That's one thing. And then I would just tell them your experience as it was. There are videos I've done some, I'm sure Dana has some where we, you know, present the information um, very simply for first time listeners. And I've even got one playlist that's focused on helping other people understand. I've got one that's how to help other people understand. So, I mean, there are lots of different resources out there, but bottom line you have to explain that it's pervasive, it's subtle, it's sneaky, that you can be in the same room as someone and it can happen. And you have to dig into the psychological abuse and manipulation side of things. What do you think, Dana? Yeah, I mean, I think the hard, the challenge with getting other people to understand is if they're not on the receiving end of it, mm -hmm. to them, they just, it's a totally different experience. It's sort of like trying to explain to somebody who's, you know, somebody's being bullied and they're trying to to talk to the principal or whatever, and they're saying, "Oh, this person's calling me fat," or they're telling calling me names. For other people, they're like, "Oh, well, sticks and stones, mm -hmm. you know, uh, will break your bones, but words can never hurt you." And you just need to, you know, basically brush it off, right? And people are quick to discount this stuff when they're not on the receiving end of it, and because there's such, it's that emotional component behind being abused or being bullied that's mm -hmm. that's the the trauma of it all you know so I, I don't even know if like and you know your kids might have been aware of like what's going on but they might come from a standpoint of like well but you stayed and um you know like there might there may or may not be a lot of like empathy or sympathy or understanding there and so I guess I would encourage you to kind of think about why, why you're telling them and how much you tell them and to just be emotionally prepared for that going in that they just might not see it from your standpoint and they might not support, support it. And if that's, if that's the case, what you have to do is say, okay, then let's just move forward as mother and child with this you know, separate relationship from that relationship with the father that, or mother. I don't, I can't remember what she said. Um, either way, what you have to do is, is focus on your relationship with your children mm -hmm. as opposed to the one with your ex, because that is an entirely separate relationship, or at least it can be. And so it, it's just really important not to dwell too long on being validated by your kids. Yeah. They may not be able to validate you for their own reasons. And, and that's why it's really important to, to work on understanding and validating it yourself as you're going forward. Yeah. And especially with the 16 year old, because if you're talking to her about everything that's happened, mm -hmm. it can be construed as a form of par parental alienation. So yeah. I, I would just be, I would kind of tread lightly with that. And I would, if anything, I would approach this whole conversation in terms of like boundaries, standards, and deal breakers, and try to make it like a learning lesson as much as possible. Um, yeah. Or, talking, yeah. Talking about like self-love and um, that it's not okay that you used to think that it was if, if you married a person or that family was forever and that you didn't have any deal breakers and that you let people treat you however you wanted to, because that's what you felt commitment was forever. And now you understand that it's not okay to be treated this way and that healthy people have healthy boundaries and healthy boundaries include having deal breakers. Yeah, and I think one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that you're when you're when you're going through this, you have to with your kids, 
what I, okay, hold on. Let me roll back. Cause I said too many words there. Bottom line. <laughs> I would tell your kids this, if there isn't some already some preexisting issue with the, you and the kids, I would just say, you know, your dad and I got divorced or we're getting divorced and I'll be happy to explain it to you if, and when you want to know, or I like I'll that. hear my side of the story, if, and when you want to know, that's it. Um, because I don't think that, I think what Dana's saying is entirely accurate. And I think you have to be very careful because no matter how sympathetic they seem in the moment, they still have some bond probably with your husband, if that's their father. And, and then they, you know, if it's not their father, all of this kind of changes a little bit. And then I would stay focused on, look, you don't have to stay in bad relationships. And here's me showing you that, you know what I mean? But outside of that, if it is their father, you have to understand that regardless of who he is, if he hasn't been just blatantly terrorizing them for their entire lives or, or just horribly abusive directly to them, they aren't going to see things from the same perspective as you. Even if he was verbally abusive to them, they still might have a certain amount of allegiance to him, which sucks, but it's true. And so, you know, maybe you teach them how to deal with him better if they ask or whatever, but just be careful how you approach it. Yeah. And then back to the nudist camp here. Um, there's, it's a supposedly a Christian nudist camp and mm -hmm. there's even children there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, you know, um, Look, I'm sorry. I don't like yeah, it. I don't like, I think that's inappropriate, Dangerous. but, um, <laughs> yeah. And potentially illegal. Like, yeah. I'm not even sure what the laws are about that, but I think regardless, the fact that your husband hid this big part of his life from you and, um, that's not okay. So even if he says, oh, well, it's a Christian camp and nothing goes on and we're just running around naked in the woods and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, that's a big thing to leave out when I ask you how your day is. Yeah. And just because you <laughs> label something Christian doesn't mean it's good. I'm sorry. Well, that's a good point too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but that's, I mean, for many of the people who I know who are very, very Christian, I don't think that would ever be appropriate. <laughs> You know, um, yeah. I'm not saying that it's anti anything. I'm not judging nudists. I'm just saying, I think that he's wrapping this up in a bow that he thinks he will like, you know, to make it look more attractive or less bad for him uh, or somebody, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're right. It is a Christian, but I'm just saying <laughs> there's no guarantee. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Strange. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Do you have any questions? Let's see. Um, Oh, here's one. Okay. Okay. This is from Sharia who says, I wanted to know how you can tell when the abused became an art. Oh, wait, I'm not sure if I understand this correctly. I wanted to know how you can tell when the abused became a narcissist or not. I wanted to know how you can tell when. I think she means if the abused person will be a narcissist. That's I kind of how I'm reading it too. Okay. So the, I think the biggest defining um, fact, factor of a tox, toxic narcissist personally is, is empathy or lack thereof. And so I think if a, a child is raised in such a way that they, I mean, the fact is that very often a narcissistic parent has a non-narcissistic child, but 50-50, they could also have a narcissist, you know? So um, I think the difference is when the child is turning as they're starting to deal with the lack of whatever it is their parent is doing, you know, whether they're not giving them affection or validation or they're just ignoring them entirely or they're fully controlling them, whatever it is, um, as the child deals with the lack of personal interaction or the lack of affection or the lack of validation, they end up doing one of two things. They either turn it all outward and love everybody else so hard they, they can't stand it or they turn it all inward and just become all about themselves. And I think that, when somebody turns it all outward, they end up being a codependent or an empath, which empaths usually are going to naturally do that anyway, right? But if they turn it back in and they focus on themselves and their own needs all the time because that's all the only person that will do that for them, for example, for, for them, for example, then, then I think you're going to get stuck with a narcissist. Is that the question? I mean, did I make any sense there? Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if she means like – like that like if or does she mean narcissistic fleas maybe i don't know or maybe if a person has been abused like could they turn into a narcissist yeah 
but not not usually as an adult as an adult um but it does happen i guess somebody could pick up the coping tactics and become a narcissist like with narcissist become narcissist like anyway um i've seen it um yeah i mean trauma is transformative and yeah. like it you know can um Sometimes they go too far the other way when trying to protect themselves. Yeah, you can put up a bunch of walls and just kind of, I mean, trauma leaves a person feeling numb and kind of causes a lack of empathy where you just don't, you know, necessarily have the emotional capacity to, to be there for other people or to even care. And that happened to me for a while. Yeah, yeah. me too. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I don't know. I don't know if I, if, it, if you're talking about like yourself, I don't know if I would... I wouldn't worry about trying to label your own behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would try to seek out help for um, the uh, CPTSD and just healing from all of this and, and give it a, seriously, give it a couple of years. Like it takes a little while to kind of get back to like your emotional, a a solid emotional baseline. Mm -hmm. Cause most people, their lives are so blown apart and it just takes, it takes a little bit for things to not to say, I don't want to over, I don't want to like discourage anybody by saying that. I mean, like the pieces can start coming together quickly, but before you start really judging or um, being like really concerned about your own behavior, I would just give it a few years for things to totally settle down. Yeah, totally. I agree. Okay. So here we have Elizabeth asking, how do you get past uh, severe depression and find self love. And then she adds, because my depression is worse, worse every day. Dana, do you want to start off on that? Or do you want me to? Well, I think, okay. So with depression, I don't know if you've seen a doctor, but this is one thing I wish I would have done years before I did. And, um, if you, if you've really felt this way for longer than like two or three months, which most of us, I remember when I had a nurse practitioner who'd asked me how long I'd been feeling this way. And it had been years. And when she'd asked if I'd been feeling this way for like longer than two or three months, I just started laughing. Cause I was like, are you kidding me? Like, no, I felt this way for like six years. Yeah. And, um, and when I got on a good medication, it was just like that heaviness lifted and I was able to function. So sometimes getting on an antidepressant can help. Um, And then lifestyle stuff, uh, vitamin, a lot of people, when they go through this, you know, their, your adrenal glands are fatigued. And if you're still living your life, not aware that you're, there's physical changes in your body, Mm -hmm. it, it can cause even more depression and just exhaustion. So like it can help to, uh, really, you know, take vitamin D, take vitamin B, make sure you're getting sunshine, make sure that you're going for getting outside, um, spending time with quality people, paying attention to like what you feed your brain, um, ideally things that are not additionally anxiety inducing. So kind of cutting back on watching the news and watching more comedy, watching more um, things that just kind of bring peace into your life. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Depression and um, depression and just getting through the part where it's, how do you find self-love? Oh, uh, do you want to pick up? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I think Dana's on point with everything she said about depression. The only thing I would add is music is great um, for, for depression. Just put your, your earbuds in and Stand up if you can, if, if not, if you, if you can, or walk around in a circle or go outside and listen while you, you know, to happy music. Like I have my silly, my happy, funny, silly, don't judge me playlist at queenbeing.com slash playlist with, with a lot of the music that kind of cheers me up and gets me moving. It's just a Google play music playlist. So anybody can look at it and there's no affiliate, anything about it. It's just a link. Um, anyway, The other thing that I would say regarding self-love is that one of the first things I had to do was release all of those, those self-limiting beliefs that had been put into me or that I had taken in. I should say, I don't want to, I don't want to give anybody else responsibility here because we have to take responsibility for our own thoughts and feelings. And, and we have to recognize the importance of the fact that we can choose what we see, what we perceive, what we believe. And by doing that, we can change our lives. We cannot change what anyone else thinks about us, but 
but one of the things that has happened to us in abuse is that somebody told us we weren't good enough. Somebody told us we were too whatever and not enough whatever. So one of the things I have my clients do is write down a list of all of those perceptions of ourselves that we have that are negative. For example, I'm too short or, you know, um, only nerds wear glasses or, you know, whatever it is, or I'm just not good enough or I'm not pretty or I'm not handsome or, or I'm whatever negative thing. You know, I don't deserve nice things. Write all those things down and then cross each thing out and write your new truth next to it. What do you want to be true? What are you going to make come true? So, you know, if you, if you think you're ugly, then cross that out and write on my own kind of beautiful and then just focus on that. And if and it sounds simple, but the act of writing it down, committing it to paper, and then physically crossing it off and writing the new truth next to it, very helpful in many ways, both energetically and mentally <laughs> speaking. And, and then to focus on what you can control, not what you can't control, to do every single day. I always tell everybody in the morning when you wake up and right before you go to bed at night, you know, just as you're laying there falling asleep, think of 10 things you're grateful for and three things you love about yourself. And why, you know, and if you're, you're probably thinking, well, self-love is, is my primary goal here. So why would I focus on the things I'm grateful for? <laughs> because that changes your vibration and makes things, um, makes you more susceptible to attracting more things to be grateful for. And the three things you love about yourself, just because you're working on your self-esteem and truly because sometimes it's hard for people to think of more than three at a time when they're struggling, but even three is a great start. To, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think the best, I think you're right on about the gratitude. It's, you know, gratitude is the best antidote to fear yeah, and to depression. And mm -hmm. it really does. I talk about this often on my channel. I mean, when I was going through stuff, I was, I had lost like pretty much everything in my life. And, and, <laughs> um, you know, really finding things to be grateful for it can be difficult, but man, I mean, having a roof over your head or a hot, clean shower or um, food in the fridge or the health that you do have, mm -hmm. little things like really being grateful yeah, for every single thing. I really looked at it as, um, it, it was just kind of, we were talking about this the other day on my channel. It was, it almost felt like spiritual warfare. And I know that that might sound kind of um, dramatic, mm -mm. especially since I'm not a, like a deeply religious person, but it seriously felt like the after this relationship, I felt like the devil was just hot on my heels and it was pulling, just pulling me down. It was such a terrible feeling and the depression and the anxiety and the overwhelm and just the darkness of everything that I'd experienced was so intense and being grateful. It felt like taking these little rocks these little rocks of gratitude and just throwing them just at that devil and just, and you can view them as like little balls of light or if you want a more positive thing, but just being like, no, I am thankful and grateful for mm -hmm. it is a, I live in a, I love Michigan. I live in a state that I love in take that, you know, and you're just chucking these kind of um, pot, like high vibration energy balls at the negativity It mm -hmm. things like that help. But, um, sorry, that was kind of off topic, but like the, no, the, you're good. <laughs> the, the, the self, the self love thing. So uh, that concept tripped me up for decades and it wasn't until I heard somewhere, I don't remember who somebody had mentioned swapping out the word love with value. Mm. So instead of like self love, so I, I'm like, oh, that sounds really narcissistic, right? Like, oh, I love myself. Because I was like, well, I mean, I guess I love myself. Like, I don't hate myself. So, like, how do I know if I love myself? Like, that just felt really nebulous. And then yeah. thinking about it in terms of value, like, valuing yourself. And so, valuing your energy, your emotions, your time, your body, your environment, like every aspect of your life. And so then getting clear, like, what does that look like? And you can start doing that, you know, now. Mm -hmm. and so I was doing things like, I mean, every act of valuing myself, again, felt like taking a ball of light and throwing it into that darkness being like, not today. Like you don't, you can't get me. Like, this is what I'm doing. Like F you, this is, this was me just trying to climb out of that hole as fast as I could. I bought a juicer. I, I was 
going on walks. I was cleaning out. I was organizing my closet. I was cleaning out junk drawers. Any little thing I could do to like value myself, value my environment, make it my own. Mm-hmm. You know, these kinds of things. The, the, the concept of self-value is such a game changer when we start moving forward to healing it's because it's really what boundaries standards and deal breakers look like in motion of like i value myself i don't get caught up in all of this drama and this chaos i don't get caught up i don't meet if i'm dating somebody new you know when i was dating um like i'm not gonna go reserve a whole afternoon for a total stranger right you know i'm gonna spend 45 minutes for coffee because i value my time and I'm not going to have them meet me at my house. I'm not going to meet them. Meet, I'm not going to meet them at their house because I value my safety. And yeah. like things like that, you know, I spend time around like high energy, high vibrational people because I value my emotions. Um, you know, I eat nourishing foods because I value my body. Yep. And th- things like that. So if you think about it in terms of like, how can you value yourself and then coming up with a bunch of ways to do it and then start doing it. It's very important. Yeah. Exponential personal growth there. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's like, a, like, like you said, it's like a, a snowball. And, and I think, I think another thing I'd like to throw in here really quick is that when you're giving yourself advice <laughs> or when you're thinking about how to handle a situation or what you deserve in a situation, um, imagine that you're talking to a different person who isn't you, whether it's your child or it's your best friend or it's your cousin or, or whoever, somebody you really care unconditionally for. And then ask yourself, what would I say if my child was an adult or is an adult and said X, Y, Z to me, said this person's being this way to me. How would I treat that my child? What would I say to my child? You know, instead of saying, oh, you're just not good enough, child, you would probably say, you're too good for that person. Why don't we work on getting you out of there or something, right? You would, you would say something more positive than you're not good enough or something more positive than you would say to yourself. So in the meantime, if you can't figure out a way to love yourself or, or value yourself enough, then think about how you would respond to someone else first and then give yourself the same advice. It, it adds up. It does. And then that goes into self-compassion, mm-hmm. which is another big piece of healing. Yes. And because it is so easy to really be so harsh on ourselves of what were you thinking? And I can't believe you did that. And well, maybe you deserved it and this, that, and the other. And just like Angie is saying, you know, if you view yourself as a child, you would, if your child, ca- oh, hurts my heart. If a child came to you and they were like, this is what's going on. Like I'm, this person's bullying me. They said mean things and they're so hurt. What would you do? You'd probably scoop them up, up into your lap. Right. And you'd probably put your arm around them and you would just say, honey, I am so sorry. That's not right. And that's not fair. And that's not okay. You don't need to be friends with that person. Right. You know, and give yourself the same love. Yes. Yes. And that's such a big part of kind of working on this, this healing and healing our inner child and these kinds of wounds and realizing that you, who has said it, Gandhi or Buddha or, Somebody said, you know, you, as much as anybody else are deserving of your love and compassion. Mm-hmm. And it's time right. that we, it's, and it's like, if that's not, if it's only a one-way street, if we're only giving that to other people, but we're not giving it to ourselves, then something's off. There's a big imbalance there. Mm-hmm. And when you start getting that things in balance, when things aren't just a one-way street, that's when your life starts to work. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. It's, it's a process. The whole thing is a process, but yeah, give it to, and you know, that I, I like to say unconditional self-acceptance. So yeah, we know, we know you're not perfect. We're not perfect either. <laughs> you know, like, don't think that we, anyone thinks they're perfect over here, but if you accept those things about yourself that aren't so great, and then instead of beating yourself up for them, you make allowances for them. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Know? It is. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, we can only know, we can only do different once we know different. Mm-hmm. And I, that was another thing I didn't get for the longest time when people talked about like forgiving yourself. I really felt like I have nothing to forgive myself for. Like, what are you even talking about? Right. And then it took, it seriously took me years to get to the point where I was like, oh, I get it now. Like I forgive myself for not seeing the manipulation and the lies for what they were 
for staying as long as I did. And for just for, and then for, I guess, just being so critical of myself Mm -hmm. afterwards, you know, and like, so yeah, really just it's acceptance. Like you did the best you could at the time. And now that you know different, you can start to do different. Yes. I think Maya Angelou said, um, don't, what did she say? Something about don't beat yourself. I don't think she said beat yourself. Forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know when you didn't know it. Mm. <laughs> That's a great quote for us, you know, because we didn't know. And I have so many people who say to me, but I was, I'm smart and I understand people. I, 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 and yet still here, I was married to this person or with this person for 10 years or 20 years or whatever. How could I have not seen it sooner? Forgive yourself and move on. Because we come up with lots of reasons why, and I could explain the psychology of it to you. <laughs> but ultimately, it comes down to forgive yourself and, and move on. And, and, and I did also, just so to be fair, I needed to do the understanding part. I needed to understand it. I need to understand everything. <laughs> <'Cause I'm a nerd. laughs> but, but whether you need to understand it or you just need to heal, for me, that was part of the healing you know, to, to dig into understanding the why of it all. And just like anything else, when you understand the reason it's, it's a little easier to navigate, I think, but that's the way my uh-huh. reality works. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I agree. People are talking about depression hmm. still in the chat. And um, uh, Shastina says that she also suffered depression for decades Therapy helps, meds can too, but staying in a relationship with a narcissist keeps depression going. Free yourself to start healing first, self-love. And I think that is so true. You know, there's, I remember seeing a meme on Instagram years ago that talked about, you know, before you like diagnose yourself as being depressed or anxious, like first make sure that you're not surrounded by a bunch of jerks. Yeah. Or narcissists. Yeah. And I, and that didn't, I didn't get that at the time and now I do. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, because it's weird. Like there's this level of awareness. Like there's, there tends to be this relationship that brings a person to these kinds like Angie and I's kind of channels. Mm -hmm. And they think it's just that one relationship. And then as their awareness about understanding manipulation and narcissism and like toxic behavior grows, they start, feeling like they're losing their mind because they're like, well, I see toxic people everywhere, right? And what's wrong with me? Am I hypervigilant? And am I dysregulated because of the abuse? What's going on? And it's like, well, that might be part of it, but probably the bigger part of it is you're seeing other people's behavior clearly for the first time ever. And if you then realize, oh my goodness, I've been going through life without any boundaries or standards or deal breakers, thinking that friendship is forever and commitments forever and families forever and giving people second and 22nd chances. And if somebody was awful to me or mean or scary or rude, I just thought it was my issue, not theirs. If you've been operating from that mindset and then you realize, oh my gosh, no, actually they're a manipulative jerk. And you've been on the receiving end of that jerk face behavior for a long time, like, yes, you're going to feel depressed and anxious. Like that's a normal way to feel if you've been on the receiving end of that kind of behavior. Right. And that level of awareness can really start setting you free. But I will say a lot of people are challenged with this. I get it. I was there, Angie, you're probably there too, where you start realizing, oh my goodness, now I have to start kind of um, distancing myself from these toxic people And then it's kind of that fear of like, well, if I distance myself from all of these toxic people, I'm not going to have anybody left. Right. And then that's another big aha moment of, well, that's a problem. (laughs) Like if all I have in my inner circle are toxic people, right. Like garbage, like, are these really friends? You know, the answer is no, they're not. Right. So it's just pulling that string on a sweater. And like Angie is saying, you know, once you start understanding all of this and how all of these pieces are just interwoven, it's you just wake up to all of this and the things, everything starts making sense. True. Yeah. It's, it's a, (laughs) I like the string on the sweater thing. That's a good, a good way to put it because it really is. I'd I'd like to wrap, uh, run back around here to Elizabeth. And she says, um, I may have to do that as in take, talk to her doctor about medicine. She says, but pills don't solve everything. And I just want to address that really quickly. Mm -hmm. You're right. 
they don't. However, what they do is they take the edge off. So here's my quick story. Um, when I left Meg's husband, I was functional. I was going to work. I was taking care of my kid. I was doing all the things, but I wasn't living. I was waking up in the morning, washing my hair, combing it back, putting a headband on and going. <laughs> it was not pretty, y'all. And I went to work that way and I didn't, you know, I was young enough that I could pull it off, I guess, at the time, but it was not me. And so basically I was showering, working and sleeping and crying a lot. Um, I went to the doctor and I think the only reason I was working is because I had to support my child because, of course, my ex-husband, <laughs> not so much help. So I went to my doctor. My doctor gave me Prozac. I took it for six months. During the six months, I healed. And I did it not because of the Prozac. What the Prozac did was it made it so that I didn't feel so devastated that I had to live in the hole of depression and I, I couldn't. I was able to start functioning again during the time. And, and I mean, beyond basic function, I was start, able to start doing my hair and my makeup, little things that seem insignificant, but matter to me. And then as I started to feel almost, almost normal, I was able to start doing the healing work that I needed to do. So what it did for me was it took the edge off the pain and it allowed me to become calm enough and focused enough that I could deal with it. Then at the end of six months, I noticed that I was not crying. I was not, I was, I was numb, I thought. And so I went to my doctor and my doctor weaned me off of the medicine because once the situational depression was over, I no longer needed the medicine, you see? But when you're in that place where you're so just in, in searing emotional pain all the time, you can't function. And so if you can't get out of it yourself, the medicine can take you or whatever you choose to do with your doctor's input, because we are not medical professionals here. Well, I'm not Nana is, but she doesn't prescribe anything. <laughs> but my point is it helped me over the hump. And then I was able to heal while I stayed as, you know, while I was calmer, while I was less distracted by my pain. And then when I was finished, I went to my doctor and they weaned me off the medicine carefully because there are issues with that apparently. And then I was fine. I never needed it again. But during that short time in my life, I was so just devastated and distraught that I couldn't function outside of very basic functions because there's something in me that forces me to take care of my children. <laughs> it's uh -huh. just who I am. But beyond that, that was it. I, I did not take care of anything else except for the very bare minimum things I had to. So it was a, it saved my life probably in some ways for a short time. Yeah. 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 And, and Helena is talking about um, the nightmares and says, even sleeping tablets do not prevent the nightmares. You know, there is a medication out there and it's worth talking to your doctor about if you're, if this has been going on, the nightmares have been going on for a while now, there's a medication called, depending on where you live, it's either called Prazosin or Prazosin. And it's a blood pressure medication, but another use of it is to treat nightmares from PTSD. Who knew? I didn't even know. Yeah. And it's really oh. effective at it. So that, you know, because it's also a blood pressure medication, it's something, you know, obviously you for sure want to talk to your doctor about and monitor your blood pressure and, you know, all, all of that. But like, that's um, something to know. So information. Talk there are, I mean, the cool thing, we, we live in the day and age where medication can help, of, you know, over the hump. Some, a lot of this stuff, it's the first handful of months are by far the worst. And it just gets, it gets progressively better over time. And, um, you know, medication is there. There's a time and place for it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, and also look into other things. I mean, I'm not, when I, I want you to know that when I'm advocating, I'm not advocating medication. I'm saying this is how my, how it worked for me, but there are lots of other things, physical exercise, music, um, you know, that are also proven to help. And all those things Dana mentioned, self-care, self-love, vibrational changing, all of that is, is also good information, but don't, you know, if you feel like the only thing that like none of that's helping or like you're not even able to try that stuff then sometimes it can help you over the hump or go talk to a naturopath who knows about natural medicine. If you don't want to take pills, cause I feel you on the not wanting to take pills thing. Believe me, I was much younger when I did this and I think maybe I would have done it differently now, but this is just what I did back then. So to throw that in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's see here. What is this? 
Okay, so we have, oh, this is a good point that uh, Divine Time made here. She says, be careful trying to explain your abuse. It can turn on you when you are the crazy one. You become the crazy one. She said they are excellent at covert abuse. And that's the truth. That's why I don't typically tell people <laughs> uh, to, to try to explain their abuse to other people. And that's why I've made several videos that help people do that because so often, you know, especially if they aren't inside the household or they don't really fully understand what you're going through, like you, narcissist shows a great face to everyone but you that the mask is solid outside of its their households so that's my experience um yeah. i have a question from monica okay um she says is it a common thing to have problems expressing yourself after narcissist abuse i say yes um i think it's very common uh, CPTSD sometimes even leads to stuttering. Um, I'd, I've gotten to this place in my life personally where I just don't bother to try to explain myself to people who don't listen. I know that you're, you're probably thinking, well, but you're talking about it on YouTube all day long. That's different because I'm only talking to the people who are listening. You know, um, in my real life, if somebody wants to ask me a question about it, I'll explain to them what I can and they can understand or not. If they choose not to, if they choose to think I'm crazy, then I choose to stop talking and I move on because I don't waste my energy or my time on someone who won't try to understand. So personally, go ahead, Dana. <laughs> yep. Yep. I agree. And I think, um, you know, it's okay to shut down conversations too. Like I had, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, it's been years since I was in my, situ my last situation and I was out at lunch with a friend of a good friend of mine and we somehow got to talking about my situation and she just didn't get it and was very kind of, um, you know, kind of the typical, like, just, she just didn't get it, you know, sort of like that would never happen to her and she just doesn't understand and this, that, and the other. And, and it just, I felt like I was being blamed and attacked and I became very defensive sure. and um, I was shocked at my reaction to it. And I guess I was so caught up in it, like, and I felt the need because she was, she's a friend. I felt the need to continue this conversation. And then after we left there, I was like, you know what? I should have just shut that down because there was no, she just doesn't get it. Right. And people that don't get it, they're just never going to get it. So um, it's okay if somebody wants to know about your experience and you're talking to them, you can always preface it with, you know, this is a very vulnerable thing for me to share this. And if I do share it with you, like, I don't want to argue about it. I don't, I really don't want you to blame me. I don't, um, like, if your questions are sincere, I'm okay with that. But like, you know, like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to feel like I'm on trial. And, right. um, you know, there's a lot of different factors. Anybody can get caught up with these people. And so, just because they haven't doesn't mean that they're healthy and have right. it all figured out. Like that's, <laughs> that's the right. thing. Nobody thinks that they're going to get caught up in like an abusive relationship or an online dating scam or a cult or any of this kind of stuff until it happens to them. Right. So totally. And get coming back around to the, the original question that she asked, I was, I just wanted to add something else. Um, I had a hard time and probably in some ways still do have a hard time really talking about me. And I, I think that, a lot of survivors go through that. Um, I'm a little bit better about it now, but like, if you look at my old videos, my oldest videos, please don't. Um, <laughs> they're terrible. They're terrible. Um, I never hardly talked about myself at all, or if I did, it was in really, really general terms. And that was because I wasn't ready to share my story yet. At some point, I did share my whole story or, you know, the, the basic bones of it anyway. And I've shared a lot of it over the, the last couple of years, but it was not an easy thing for me to do. And I still had a lot of fear of my abusers uh, for a long, long, long time. So, you know, even after I started YouTube at first, now I'm over it completely, but I did for a long, long, long time. And so it, it's, don't, don't beat yourself up for not being able to express yourself, just work on it. Practice journaling. And it, I think a lot of times when it comes to talking about yourself, that's when you struggle. I've seen lots of survivors be able to talk about everybody else <laughs> all day long. But the minute you ask them about themselves or what they're all about or what they love or whatever, they're like, ah, I mean, whatever, I don't know, <laughs> bye bye daughter or whatever, you know, they go off on whoever they can talk about. So I think maybe that's what she was 
I don't know. Okay. Anyway, you got a question. Well, well you know, and I think, um, I think too, with the trouble expressing ourselves after abuse is when people lack the vocabulary for it, yeah. you know, and, um, I feel like I had really retreated within myself because I felt like whenever I tried to explain to people what had happened, I sounded crazy and like I was being dramatic and um, like just not heard. And so, it, but it wasn't and when I found my first support group and I heard all these terms like, you know, narcissistic abuse and narcissistic rage and um, all of this like triangulation and projection and flying monkeys and hoovering and, you know, on and on and on, it was like everything began making sense. And I had the words to put to my experience. And then that was a, a, a game changer. Yeah. And I don't know about you, Dana, but when I was in the middle of these relationships, I was taught not to talk about myself. I would, I was shut down if I tried to, and this started all the way back from childhood for me. And so I got to this point where I realized nobody wanted to hear what I had to say about me. And so even, even today, sometimes if people in, in person, you know, ask me what I do, I'm like, you know, I'm on YouTube or I wrote some books or whatever. I don't really go into any de detail unless they really push me for it. And, and I think that a lot of us do that. We get to that place where we're just like, you know, I don't really have anything to say. Like I personally, I'm so busy and I'm always running around doing all my things. And I, I feel like uh, this is sounds, it's going to sound really bizarre, but I feel like even now, like our friends around here, most of them know my husband <laughs> better than me because I'm not standing in the front of the, you know, the line saying, let's talk about me. <laughs> I'm standing, you know, behind everybody, like, look at all these cool people I get to be related to <laughs> or whatever my, my husband or my children, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I know that sounds funny because obviously some people know who I am, but a <laughs> <laughs> couple or whatever, but I, I do, I feel, I still feel like that today. I still struggle to, to really um, talk about what I do or what I'm about personally, except to y'all. <laughs> so that's cool. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. A little, a little embarrassed about that. <laughs> okay. Moving right along. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, there. And see, Deborah says uh, to Monica, yeah, I would say yes, because when you tried with a narcissist, you're always forced to suppress how you feel. That's the truth. I, that's another excellent point, not just about yourself, but about it, everything. You know, you had to just suck it up and pretend that you felt however the narcissist wanted you to feel in the most toxic relationships. You know what I mean? So that was probably another factor. Yeah. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Go ahead, Dana. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I agree completely. I think once and for a lot of people, this starts at a pretty young age where they realize that only certain wants and needs and thoughts and feelings and opinions are valid and any else, anything else causes chaos and, and conflict. Yeah. And so they learn pretty quickly of, okay, I'm just going to start really editing mm -hmm. myself. Yeah. And then we're like grinding down our own edges, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. And you forget how to talk about yourself or how to talk about anything that's of interest to you. In fact, I even got to the point for a while where I didn't create interests for myself or I didn't indulge in interest in myself. I tried be, to be interested in what they were interested in because I thought that it would make them happier. And I tried not to stand out because I thought it would make them happier. It's weird. And as Shastina says, adds, uh, she says, Narcula, <laughs> that's a, that's a term we developed uh -huh. over there. Uh, would always <laughs> tell me everything is not about you made it harder to voice my, my feelings, projection, manipulation. Yeah. And, and that's why so many targets of abuse, you know, feel like they're the problem. And then they wonder, oh no, am I the narcissist? Am I manipulative? Am, is it me? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like, that's the thing with you, with the narcissist, like if you try to set boundaries, if you try to assert yourself, if you stand up for yourself, they'll accuse you of just being mean and sensitive, abusive, manipulative, because you're not giving them what they want. And yeah. that messes with the person's head when they're like, I don't think I'm manipulative. Like, but may, you know, it's, oh God. It's rough. Yeah. Yeah. It's rough. And it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make anyone's life. It makes us doubt everybody else. It helps us not trust anybody and it's not even ourselves. Yeah. Sylvia <laughs> says, I told my aunt after three years and she just texted to go stay at a shelter. And then she did come and told my ex to stop. She told me to see a counselor and break up and I have to control my reactions. And she says, 
uh, Benjamin, if they said that they're not worth your time, I don't, I, oh, she was just finding someone else on that. But yeah, so, you know, I think you're, she's right that she has to control her actions. It's hard when somebody tells you to go stay in a shelter and maybe you were hoping for something more than that. But, um, or, or if the narcissist is needling you and trying to provoke you into a reaction and, yeah. or suck you back in, like, I think one of the, the most helpful things in um, a person's healing is understanding the concept of hoovering and that there's this cycle. It's idealized, devalue, discard, and you're going to go around and around. There's nothing, there's no forward momentum. It's just right. around and around and around and around and around and around and around until you either get kicked off the cycle or you jump off. It's yeah. like there you go around from hell. And because it's so easy to get caught up in thinking like, well, this time they cried. They've never cried before. This time they said they were sorry. This time they did this. This time they did that. This time. And it's like, this is where it goes back to having boundaries, standards, and deal breakers is if somebody is treating you terribly and they have little to no empathy or remorse, sincere empathy or remorse, and they just keep getting better at hiding their behavior or their behavior just keeps getting worse, like it's time to go. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. Um, I think that's what keeps people stuck. Yes. You know, is because it's, and I think that's one of the number one questions we get around here is people are like, well, how can I tell the difference between like a narcissist and just, and just somebody who lies and cheats and steals and, you know. Like, does it matter? <laughs> right, exactly. And that's, that's the thing is exactly, but in, right. you know, but. Like when a person's, and the fact that a person's even questioning that, like that, I should write a book of like all of the pivotal aha moments, because I feel like we all kind of hit the same ones. Yeah. Um, that's one of the earliest ones. And it's such a big one, because if you're thinking that it does matter, then there's something really off about your boundary standards and deal breakers. Yeah. 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 And odds are this hasn't been the first, this is probably not your first go around with somebody with really toxic behavior. This person might just be the one with the most extreme toxic behavior that you're, you're like, well, I have PTSD. Like, yeah, I've encountered other problematic people in my life, but nothing to this extent. But that this person is the gateway. Like they're that string on the sweater, you start pulling it and you're like, oh my goodness, actually, yeah, I had a friend in junior high or you know what, my mom's kind of a bitch or, you know, like, and you need to start unraveling it and you're like, okay, yeah, actually this, there's been quite a few people. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say something. I just realized somebody mentioned my audio levels are fluctuating again. It has to do with the way my microphone is interacting. So next week I'll wear a headset and we won't have this problem and I apologize now for that. <laughs> Yeah. Maya says here, yeah, just, is he a narcissist or is he just a wife beater? Right. Right. Like, but That's I think, point. but I think that the, the big aha moment is, is in the realization that most normal, decent people go through life thinking that other people are normal, decent people. And that if they're not, that they're just, they're just a baby bird with a broken wing and that we either need to be more compassionate and understanding, or we just need to triple up our efforts on communication to get them to understand that what they're doing is a problem. Mm -hmm. and that's an inaccurate understanding of other people. And so understand that there's just some people out there that do not share the same moral compass as us and they never will. And they're not interested in changing. Communication is not the issue. They're totally fine with their behavior. They will most likely always be fine with their behavior. Like understanding the concept of personality disorders. Like this is a real thing that people can be, have such a disordered personality that it's the issue isn't getting through to them. The issue is just them. Yeah. And then that kind of sets people free. I think just understanding. Yeah. That. Absolutely. And I think, um, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I have a question from yeah. Benjamin. Um, Benjamin says that basically when he went into this marriage, knowing you know, his wife knew that he was, he wanted multiple children. Um, and he says, but then the day after they got married, she changed her mind and she decided that she didn't want to have multiple children. They have one child, 
And, mm-hmm. and now he says, isn't that way off a boundary deal breaker? She went into the relationship no, knowing I wanted children, plural. The day after marriage decides I'm not suitable, spent six years trying to get me a vasectomy. Um, I, he said, I should have left her at the I-5 rest area at Camp Pendleton when she did that. He said, instead, hold on a minute. Instead, uh, having said the vows, I took the high road and now I'm destroyed for it. Yeah. So I think, um, number one, yes, definitely your, um, if, if that was a deal breaker for you, you have to determine what your deal breakers are. It would be a deal breaker for me. Um, not now cause I'm never having any more children, but I already have three, so it's different, <laughs> but, um, but it would have been at the time because I knew I wanted at least one more child. I had one child when I started off and then I knew I wanted at least one more. Um, and I had two more and now I'm done. So, but, but I think that's up, up to you. And I think that if you had your, you know, in hindsight, we can always know what to say in hindsight, right? Then in hindsight, you would have had to have that set up ahead of time. Okay. So then I would, I said to my husband, here are my deal breakers. <laughs> he knew it from the beginning. So that's something that you can, um, you know, as you move forward in your life, know, okay, here's what I need to, you know, when, when, and if you get into another relationship, you know, have your deal breakers, two, three deal breakers, you know, set up ahead of time, know what they are. And before you marry this person say, or before you even get seriously involved, say, okay, listen, here are my deal breakers. Not when you first meet them, not the first day, <laughs> but when you do commit to each other, when you're ready, then, you know, so for example, I think Dana and I have similar ones. I'm, I'll tell you mine. Then if she wants to tell you hers, that she can't. Um, mine are number one, don't hit me. Number two, don't cheat on me. And number three, don't hurt my children or me in any other way. Like no emotional abuse, all that kind of stuff too. So Dana, I know yours are kind of similar, but what, what are yours? Yeah. Um, uh, no abuse of any kind, no active addictions mm-hmm. of any kind, um, no adultery or cheating and um, no bad attitude. Yeah. So I don't want to come home to somebody who's chronically trying to drag me down or tell me why everything is not going to work and that hates their life. And, you know, I, like, yep. I just, you know, a big wet blanket all the time. Like I need somebody who's kind of like solutions oriented. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the yeah. opposite for me, it's like my deal breakers are the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. So just kind of like a, a healthy, balanced person that's, that, that, it is energizing and empowering. And, and then I, so it's, it's reciprocal, right? Yeah. Like I give that, they give that, and then we grow together. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So know your deal breakers ahead of time. And in the meantime, Benjamin, you know, give yourself a little bit. Oh, it looks like he brought over her and her son from the Philippines. Um, you have to be very careful. And, and make sure you know a person really well before you bring them over from another country again. Yeah. Just, I'm not trying to be funny, but honestly, yeah. it's very difficult to know a person without spending a, a you know, decent amount of time with them ahead of time. And somebody, I don't know how you met her, but sometimes people who are on those sites to meet, you know, a new wife from another country, sometimes they're not very safe. Just be very careful, please. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, let's see here. How about this for the last question? And then we'll wrap it up. This is from Deborah who asks, how do you, this is a big question. How do you create solid boundaries when you were never taught boundaries? My mother was a narcissist. I just realized this in the past two years. That's a great, great, great question. Okay. So you have to decide what, what is acceptable to you and what is not. And so like you have to go, you have to respect yourself enough, first of all, and and um, accept yourself enough. So for me, this is going to sound horrible, but I'm just going to put it out there anyway. When I was, <laughs> when I was looking, you know, when I was ready to start dating and whatever, I, I wasn't necessarily that excited about the idea of dating a guy with kids, which I know is hypocritical sounding because I already had a kid, but I knew that in my case, the ex was going to fall off the planet <laughs> and he did because he was just very self-centered. And when he realized that being with my kid didn't benefit him in some way toward our relationship or toward anything else, he was out. And I knew that was going to happen. I, you just know sometimes, right? <laughs> and so for me, I felt like it opened. I w- not that I'm saying that it's acceptable that I felt this way. This was a long time ago. And I don't, I'm not saying I would feel that way today. But back then I felt that way and I 
and I made that one of my dating things. I wouldn't date somebody if they had kids necessarily. Now I'm not saying, let's be honest. If I met the right person and they had kids, I totally would have overlooked that. But it was something, it was a quality I was searching for. So my point is decide what you want. Decide what is acceptable to you, what is not. Make sure your standard your standards are high enough for yourself because we often aren't very careful with our standards for ourselves. Uh, ask yourself what boundaries you would set for your child if your child were starting to date or if your child were in a relationship, what would you ask them to do for themselves or your friend or your whatever? You know, I think starting to set boundaries is not just about dating though. It's about, you know, that friend that calls you at three o'clock in the morning drunk and needs a ride home and you get your ass up out of bed and go pick them up. Stop that. You know, Mm -hmm. teach them about Uber. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like don't, you know, start to set boundaries now, not just because you're going to get into a relationship, but start to set boundaries now with the people who are in your life. Some people won't like it. Some people will show their ugly side when you do it, but do it and, and keep going. It'll be a little uncomfortable at first, but it's worth it. Yep. And I think, um, a good way to to kind of tune into what boundaries need to be set is to really start to realize that boundaries are an extension of yourself and their extension of how like you value your energy, your time, your emotions, all of these things. Mm-hmm. If like what we were talking about earlier, when, when we have been so conditioned to not have wants or needs or thoughts or opinions or feelings about things, a person gets really separated from that. And one of the, the challenges with reconnecting is understanding that our feelings are oftentimes a really great, indicator of our environment. So for example, uh, if you can start practicing tuning in to when you feel irritated, that's generally one of the first signs that there's been a boundary violation. Mm-hmm. And then that, that ir- feeling of irritate, maybe I should back up, confusion. It starts off with maybe confusion and then it grows to irritation. Then it might grow to resentment or anger and then resentment. If yep. you're feeling feelings in, in that kind of area, those tend to be because a boundary needs to be tightened up. And the thing with boundaries is other people don't know where our boundaries are. We have to let them know. No, like Angie was saying, you might have a friend that calls you at 3 a.m. That might really irritate and annoy you, but they might call the next person who's also a partier who just called them the night before and they might not have any issue with it. Right. So our boundaries are a very individual thing, but if you can start- Yeah, like keying in to how you're feeling. And then, you know, the next time, maybe the next day or whatever, like what I had to do, I had friends, I had people calling me all the time. I wasn't getting sleep. It was, I was irritated. I was annoyed. I didn't connect that to setting boundaries because I was thinking about boundaries only within certain circumstances, like mainly with dating. Yeah. And So letting people know, hey, you know what, guys, like I turn my phone off at like nine o'clock because I like to read for a little bit before I go to bed. So I love you, but Mm -hmm. I don't I'm not going to check my phone after nine o'clock. Right. And so you just start setting limits with people. If somebody wants to date you and they're like, hey, come over to my house, I'll make you dinner. And you're like, oh, you know, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Like, yeah, I've spent probably 10 hours, which is way too much, but I've spent 10 hours texting and chatting with this guy before we've met. I feel like I kind of know him, but there's a part of me that feels really off. Like those kinds of feelings are signs that your inner self is like, hey, boundary violation. Yes, that's right. That's a great point. And so then redirecting it and being like, hey, you know what? Can we meet for coffee? Or that probably even better would be to back it up even further. So the next person when you're dating to not invest all of that time and getting to know a person before you actually meet. Yes. Good point. Yeah. 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 I I like that. And I wanted to add um, one other thing. And and that is that don't apologize for your boundaries. (laughs) And, and like Dana was saying, they are very, very personal individual specific to you. And, and so like she said, don't, I'm just reiterating, don't set a boundary because your mother tells you to, or because she, your ex told you to or whatever. And, I know what those are. And, and, you know, like, as we were chatting here, I thought of the, when I was dating someone, I had these rules, like I was not allowed to commit to someone until after a certain point in time, I was not allowed to, 
you know, be proposed to until after a year of monogamous dating. And there were rules about when they could meet my kids for myself. I wrote these rules because I know how I am. <laughs> and I am this kind of girl who, if I don't have some kind of a specific set of rules, not as much now as I used to be, I will just go all, go all willy nilly and not think. And I've grown past a lot of that, but for a long time, I needed those rules written down physically so that I would be, I felt like I was, I had to force myself to follow them. So I didn't get in another toxic relationship. And that was probably because I was, I was not fully healed at the time, but I've grown past that now. <laughs> so, but it worked yeah. for me at the time. Yeah. And actually real quick, last, last thing I want to touch on, cause this goes perfectly with this um, VIP kid teacher says, I went on a date recently and the guy flat out tells me he is an alcoholic and emotionally unavailable. I thanked him for his transparency, no second date. Clearly not still ready. This is what's interesting to me. So then she says, it makes me wonder what attracted him to me. Okay, we can make ourselves nuts trying to figure out what is it, is it, you know, about us. The, the thing is, though, you, you nipped it in the bud. And narcissists are problematic people in general are attracted to a wide variety of people. You might physically be his type. I mean, that might be all there is to it. It might not be that he like sniffed out your vulnerability and like knows about your unhealed childhood wounds. Like it doesn't even have to be that deep. It might just be like he thought you were cute. It's very possible. You know, so it's, I'm a big fan of, because we can make ourselves nuts with that. It's not about necessarily like, that we're attracting these people. It's more about getting them out of our lives when problematic stuff surfaces. I think you handled that beautifully. You nipped it in the bud right away. You didn't minimize it. You didn't justify it. You didn't like, you know, go on the attack. Like it was just appropriate professional, like you boundary setting. Like I'm, I, I wish you well in this life, but this is more than I'm wanting to take on right now. That's all any of us can do. True. So, I mean, cause you can, you can heal all kinds of wounds and childhood wounds and be the most healthy, well-balanced, amazing person. And, and honestly, the more you do that, probably the brighter your light is going to shine and the more problematic people you're going to attract. Yeah. They love the bright light. They do. They, they always like to reach what I call above their heads where, uh, you know, to go for people they think are better than them. So, yep be aware. <laughs> so, yeah. So I wouldn't, don't, don't internalize that. It happened. You caught it. You nipped it in the bud. You handled it beautifully. Okay. Agreed. Drive on. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right. On. Okay. I, I, we are at time and I am going to go get a haircut today. <laughs> yes. Nothing terribly exciting. I just a trim, a little trim. <laughs> but little trim. Um, <laughs> little trim. <laughs> Right yeah. on. Well, Angie, thank you so much for being here as always. Pleasure. And you guys, we Angie and I do this live stream every Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We alternate channels. So next week we will be over on her channel, uh, Angie Atkinson across the interwebs. And I will be putting all of her contact info down below after this video renders and goes live. Right on. See you next time, everybody. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Take care. Bye, Dina. Thanks. Bye.